best description I found of your company. I quote, a bunch of brilliant nerds are legally making money distributing content they don't own on the internet. <laughs> so, with that, how does Ariel work? So should I be proud of the nerd part or the brilliant part? <laughs> oh. let's, let's stick with the brilliant part. Um, you, you know, it's, it's an interesting uh, question and description because we actually don't distribute anything. The whole point of Aereo has been that uh, consumers can, um, you know, go get an antenna themselves. We just figured out a smaller, smarter, simpler, what I'll say, a more modern uh, version of it uh, and built a whole lot of technology around it. Right, so let's back that up a second. So the idea is, like, if I want to watch TV, I don't have to pay anybody to do that. I can go out and buy some bunny ears, right? Uh, you already have paid. Uh, it's called the Congressional Spectrum Grant that started in the 1930s and 40s, uh, which is, you know, probably some estimates are uh, 40 to 60 billion dollars. So the consumers have already paid for that okay. uh, license, and you can uh, go get a bunch of bunny ears or uh, over-the-top antenna, and you can watch TV. And so when I first learned about you, the thing that intrigued me the most, Chet, was that somewhere in Brooklyn, the borough in which I then lived, um, there was a warehouse with a bunch of bunny ears that you all had put there. That's so, right. um, so explain to us then how the service works. What as a customer am I paying for when I pay for your service? So you're paying for the technology that you license from us. So think of it as a SaaS application for direct to consumers. Right. Uh, and you get uh, storage, DVR, uh, streaming capabilities, applications, uh, antennas, etc., all that packaged in for a very low price. Uh, but the whole idea is you're paying for technology, and that's actually the thesis behind Aereo is that the future of this business, media industry in general, uh, will call, will allow for a decoupling of traditional distributors' technology to just consumer grade technology that consumers can buy anytime with sort of an open marketplace on top that people can buy and sell content and package it and do all kinds of interesting things. And so, so how does the business model work, as in how much are consumers paying for the service right now? So we, uh, consumers pay either 8 or $12, depending on the plan they take. We average about $10. And uh, they, um, you know, it's online. You don't have to buy a box, equipment, or any of those things. And, uh, you know, our costs are reasonably low. Uh, we create all the technology ourselves. We manufacture things ourselves. Um, it's a really great team. Uh, so we hope we'll make a bunch of money doing it. So um, you have a bunch of money. You have a very big backer in Barry Diller. Yes. Um, and that's been very necessary because you also have a slew of, um, shall we call them, enemies. Or at least perhaps sometimes they term themselves enemies. Um, you've been the subject of a number of lawsuits. And in fact, recently you had a big victory, right? Yeah, well, I don't think of any of these companies as enemies, uh, because I think you know the, the industry is changing and evolving, and incumbents, uh, they have large, great businesses. And frankly, they were great businesses well before we came along. And uh, they have every interest to figure out how they're going to morph and change this interest. And that may include certain you know, approaches that they take towards us, help us, against us, whatever that happens to be. So I don't, I don't really think of them as enemies. And uh, That said, you had not actually launched before you were sued, right? We had announced our intention to be launched. Yes, that's right. So that was in the New York market. That was just over a year ago. And maybe you can just tell our audience, what happened once you announced your intention to launch? So we announced our intention to launch uh, somewhere around, I think, February, what's Valentine's? February 14th. February 14th. Um, that's a good day to remember, by the is, way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we announced then, and I think we were sued by in the New York market somewhere around March time frame. Uh, well before we had actually launched anything. And uh, we actually, as a result of that, we just ran our beta through uh, fall at that point until we won our first, sort of first major victory in the court. And since then, uh, we've been slowly growing out the subscriber base in New York. Um, and then recently have started expanding to, we announced 22 additional cities that we wanted to get done in the first half of the year. So We're right now your service exists in uh, Boston, Atlanta. in addition to New York City, Boston, Atlanta, Atlanta, and today, big and news. We, uh, we announced Salt Lake City, uh, we've announced Chicago, and there'll be, in the next two to three weeks, about 13 or 14 more that uh, we will layer in. And now the cadence is going to be 
every week or two weeks, there'll be two or three or four cities, depending on the pace that we get the work done. And I want to get to the, the future strategy in a minute, but I want to go back to the, just the timeline and the history of the lawsuits. So you, uh, we're back in 2012, February 2012. Um, you were sued by basically all the big networks in the New York market. 17 plaintiffs, 17 or 18, I forget. 17 or 18. That must make media cocktail parties a little awkward in New York. <laughs> Fortunately, I was never one for going to them, so, uh, and they don't invite me, they never did, so it's okay. So that works. Um, so um, essentially, uh, the court found in your favor. Yes, the, the trial court had a trial, effectively, sure. a mini trial. Uh, I got to wear a tie and go testify and uh, expert witnesses and everything else. Because there was a lot of debate, you know, how could you do it with a small antenna when it historically has been this large? Right. And, uh, you know, we, there was lots of experts and people agreed that, yes, of course, it's possible. And in fact, the technology and the judge found that the technology worked exactly as we advertised. And if it did, then it was legal. And right. so that was a big uh, decision. Now, it was a preliminary stage of the trial, uh, which was appealed in the appellate court uh, in I think we had a hearing at the end of 2012, sure. which we heard the decision in April of 2013, which was again, a really, really solid opinion from our perspective that really clarified the basis in law, the basis in congressional intent, policy arguments for it, and how the technology worked. Right. And uh, which was then again appealed. It was sort of like a do-over over a do-over. Uh, that was requested, and about a week ago, the appellate court denied that it would not allow that uh, do-over. Um, for the New York market? For the Second Circuit. For the Second Circuit. Um, because then also you were, you did, sort of came back, was it uh, NBC that sued you in the Boston market? Uh, no, Hearst Media, Hearst which Media. Uh, owns one of the affiliates uh, okay. for CBS, I think. I'm not certain, but yeah. So um, it seems from all of these lawsuits like you have the potential to be really disruptive. Um, but I wonder, and I often hear asked, um, what do you know about whether consumers want this service? Are they, are they willing to pay for it? Are, are you getting users? Um, so lots of questions in there. Um, Indeed, it's my job. Um, do consumers want the service? Absolutely. And, and um, you know, mainly because we see the user behavior. Uh, yeah. as, and, and by the way, the basis of this company was when I was running my last company, I noticed something very interesting, which was, about, you know, about 25% of the people essentially watch network television, and they had digital cable. Mm -hmm. Fifth, almost 80% of the households watch seven or eight channels. Now, they weren't all seven or eight channels, the same channels, but they were on the top 10 channels on the dial. Mm -hmm. uh, but then on the negative side, if you take out ESPN and HBO, the pie gets relatively small, and in addition, now you've seen all the migration of content. People don't watch channels anymore, right? They watch shows. Right. All of that content is making into online libraries. So unless you really are a diehard ESPN fan, y you know, there's lots of ways to skin this cat at a fraction of the price. And, and then you compare that to the emerging trend. You know, median cable subscription age has gone up 10 years or since 2000. So all that information comes into the, mar you know, in somebody like us and says, well, there's a meaningful opportunity here. Now, obviously, these are very early days, and we have to sort of build a business, and get things right. So what do you know about how many users you have? Are you willing to tell us? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not. Uh, OK, so what do you know about how many users? Well, I think, I think the, last, the last re publicly reported number was 2,000 users. So I'll stick to that house. Then. OK, 2,000 users? Um, if that were most likely the number, I don't think you would be on this stage right now. Just, just saying. Um, so, I'm curious, what percentage of the market are you going for here? I mean, what looks like, what's success for you? Uh, we think the starting point for us, we think it's, it's we can get to a 25% penetration. 25% uh, penetration. On a population basis. Okay. And we think that that number, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot long, hard road for us because it's a fair bit of technology. It's not, unfortunately, just a website that we set up, right? It's almost like a cellular company. We go city by city, we set up infrastructure. It's a lot of capital that we have to deploy, right. um, all for a grand purpose of basically creating sort of this platform, this marketplace where uh, the future entertainment options will become available. Right. Uh, so we think that window is probably a five-year window for us, maybe seven-year window. I don't know the numbers. So just so I understand, so within five to seven years, you hope to be at a place where one in four people in this room 
will be subscribers. In one way, shape, or form. So it sounds a little Whether bit like a... Whether or not they take cable. Like a Netflix model. Um, well, you know, I think Netflix was, in, it, I think, is an incredible company. I mean, they have, um, they've had, all, like all businesses have their, have their challenge. But again, let's not forget where the starting point was, which was mailing DVDs, right? No different than renting antennas in some way, shape, or It's a right. very similar copyright argument to some extent. And once you get a user base, then you can really explore what options. Now, we're not a content company. We think of us as our chosen place in life is to create technological value for other content creators that might want to use right. this technology in the future. Right. But again, these are early days. Who knows? I may be fired in two years. It's been known to happen. Founders usually get fired. That never happens. Um, and uh, who knows about. after that, it may be a completely different company. So I'm holding in my hand here the bunny ears, uh, modern day bunny ears. You're going to have to really squint to see these. And while you're squinting, I also want to turn to you, the audience, for some questions for Chet. Uh, do we have any warm-up questions in the house? All right. Where are we at? Oh, back there. With uh, Adam, I want you to model for everybody how you say your name and your organization before you ask the question. Yeah, a question from someone else. Hey, oh. Chet. Hi, Jesse. Hey, uh, how Zan are you doing? Xander Lurie, formerly of CBS. Um, Hi, Xander. Chet, put aside the <laughs> legality question the courts are answering. When you think about the broadcast networks and the retrans growth that's helped their businesses and the spectrum trade, which enables them to go kind of cover news in Afghanistan and pretty unprofitable places around the world, why won't they just take their good shows and sell them to cable networks? It seems there's kind of a discrimination here against broadcast networks who are spending three, four, five million dollars on dramas, but also a billion dollars a year on football. So won't the ecosystem just respond to all the, all the households who pull off cable? Can you talk a bit about what's gonna happen to the ecosystem? Um, well, clearly they're their own businesses, so they can choose to do whatever they wish to do. Uh, my belief is that I think the audience scale that broadcast represents, the localism, the tie-in with the affiliates, the strength, and frankly, the statutory power that Congress gives them along with that position in the dial has certain implications. And I think that's the equivalent of saying, uh, well, you shouldn't be able to use an antenna. And, th and this is sort of the, the confusion, I think, in people's minds is, Aereo's technology isn't applied towards a cable channel, for instance, right? It's purely applied towards free-to-air broadcast, and irrespective of uh, the size, shape, location of the antenna, the idea that a consumer can have an antenna has been true from time immemorial. Now, we went through a lot of exercise to design things to comply, and frankly, it's sort of hilarious in the press, right, where people say, well, you know, they've designed the technology solely so that they can do this. Well, what's wrong with that? The whole point is to comply with the law. So my belief is I don't think uh, that that argument sustains uh, itself uh, just because the, the regulatory power, statutory power, the audience access, and frankly, if you start looking at the business landscape that's evolving as well, right? Not to, not to point fingers here, but uh, the reality of what's happening in New York is a good precursor to the incredibly competitive dynamic of this marketplace that I think cries out for alternatives that uh, need to exist. So, okay, we'll go right back there. And um, I'm squinting to see you, so give me your name when you ask your question. A mic is coming your way. Mike. We're going to go first to here and second, first to you and second to you. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Mark Johnson. I'm CEO of Zeit. Um, and full disclosure, we're now owned by CNN, which is owned by Turner, which is owned by Time Warner. Um, but one thing I learned when- Not a uh, plaintiff in our situation, so that's totally OK. <laughs> Actually, Although they do think on record that we're inconsequential, so that's OK, too. Yeah. <laughs> so um, about two weeks after I'm Zeit applying launched, for the next, what's it, well, staff for Albania in the army situation. With <laughs> no comment. Um, uh, about two weeks after we launched, um, we got a cease and desist from eight or nine major media companies, which kind of shocked us. And one of the things that it taught me was, um, A, that it's really good to disrupt media because media needs a lot of disruption right now. But the second thing it taught me was that it's really important to play nice with the content providers. So after that nasty gram we got from the lawyers, it amazes me still that the general counsels were able to agree on language in just two weeks. Um, we talked to the business people and started to figure out how to play nice with media companies. 
Um, and we've done a really good job of that over the next two years, consequently being acquired. So I just wonder, what are your thoughts on that about, you know, how do you play nice in this industry? So playing nice. Um, we didn't get a cease and desist. We might have thought about it, but we didn't get one. Um, I think the, look, at the end of the day, I think once you let the noise factor die down a little bit, right, I think a technology company that's creating incredibly low cost, highly valuable technologies is interesting to a lot of people. And I think that applies towards advertising, that applies towards consumer experiences, that applies towards, and I really do take a step back and I say, look, neutral tech companies are a lot more interesting to the media business and should be than large balance sheets that finance those that tech because the large balance sheet comes with an agenda of some way, shape, or form of essentially control. So I do think that that idea will resonate at some point. Uh, you know, just to be clear, right, we didn't sue anybody. We actually went around and showed people what we were doing. Uh, so we, again, that's still our shtick. It's like we're happy to work with whoever wants to, you know, we're happy to license people technology, show them what we're doing, and all of those things. But I think this, the industry has sort of a way of, you know, annealing, and I think it takes a little while. It's just kind of... And by the way, on full disclosure, it's not like I'm some sage in this industry, right? I'm a pretty small company, and, and uh, you know, so we'll see how things develop. Uh, I have always had a faith that I think um, media companies need interesting, neutral technology companies that can uh, create a relationship, and I think it takes a while for those things to develop. Right back here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mark Anderson, Strategic News Service. I am a huge fan, by the way. Thank you. And we just did a deep dive into TV and the future of TV, and your company and your name was right in the front. So I'm really pleased to have you here on stage. Um, I, I watched way, your C-SPAN th interview. This is for a uh, witness protection program that I'm growing now. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw the C-SPAN interview yesterday. It's an hour-long C-SPAN. You did a really great job, I thought. And, Thank uh, you. But it, it raised one question in my mind. This is a, probably a legalistic thing, but it's very important. Totally agree that we own the airwaves. We gave them to those guys, and, and you're doing the right thing. But I noticed that in your, on your website, you say, you know, you'll only, uh, if I'm a subscriber, I have to be in Boston to get the local. And when I drive out of that range, then I lose the ability to get that programming. I assume there's a legal reason for that. So my question is, will it always be like that in your business model? And, and how do you cover, do you just only cover certain NFL cities then, or how do you, how do you actually do this? Well, the ambition, so to answer the second question, the ambition is to build out 50, 70 cities as, as much as we possibly can, and, and potentially even open up the technology from a partnership perspective, relationships. I, I fully don't know kind of how, where we're gonna end up. But you can almost draw the line out and think of it as a utility at some point, or an antenna utility that's available in the ether. Uh, the first question of geolocation, geolocking, you know, I do believe that there is sort of this whole notion of localism. There are obviously implied rights along with that localism that go in. Uh, again, as, as a company who set out to say, we understand it's a complicated landscape, but let's try our utter best to comply, to try to fit within the mold as much as, now, fully understanding that the chosen path that we've taken was to try to create an alternative. So yes, we are non-compliant in the sense of, we don't, you know, we're not in some country club that's saying, um, you know, come hang out with us. But be that as it may, I actually ask the same question to myself and our team. I can, as a consumer, go get a sling box today, right? And it's a perfectly legal device. In fact, you know, lots of judges and Congress people use sling boxes to watch TV from their home district. So why does Aereo restrict that? And I, I don't think I have a solid answer with the exception of saying we only had an appetite to test so much from a legal thesis perspective, right? So it was purely a question of how much were we willing to take. So Chet, um, you know, it was reported this morning that um, in the standoff between Time Warner and I think it's CBS in New York, Time Warner was, um, it was probably, you know, contractual, you know. Uh, Retransmission. Control. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, that Time Warner was potentially uh, thinking about encouraging its, uh, its users, its subscribers to, um, get Aereo as a way to twist CBS's arm and get them to step up. Um, just curious, do you think that that's a good thing, a bad thing? Uh, well, I think, you know, we're pretty consistent. We have no, we're not gonna side with Time Warner or anybody else in this. In you talk with thing. Time Warner about that? Uh, I keep my, I don't answer on, uh, I don't answer phone calls. I don't know who the number comes. <laughs> uh, but they've called. I, they didn't call me. All right. Um, 
So, so I have a very simple, which is, you know, we're not paying, playing for a short-term game here, right? The goal is this platform. And I don't know how long it's going to take. It may take two years, five, 10, 15, who knows, right, how long it'll take. So the goal from our side is not to dip our toe into any of these, somebody else's disputes. Uh, to the extent Time Warner promotes the idea that consumers have alternatives and choices, well, wouldn't that be a change, right? right. Uh, that would be such a dramatic change and a validation of the fact that the cost structure of this industry is getting to the point where this cabal is now questioning that relationship. You know, so leave Aereo aside for a second, and you know, whether Aereo existed or not, I think irrespective of that, the cost structure is getting to that point where those fights are gonna get more and more pronounced, more heightened, and more dramatic. So I think the fact that one of them, and then I think the Cablevision Viacom lawsuit, which addresses antitrust concerns around packaging, I think you're beginning to see sort of these mini shifts and cracks and fissures emerge, uh, which is gonna be interesting to see how it develops. Well, so you become um, very useful in a negotiation like that because you are, at long last, an option. Um, is that ultimately a, a good thing for you? I think alternatives for consumers, absolutely good things, no question about it. Um, and I think you know, anytime you have sort of a highly integrated monopolistic system, um, Everybody gets fed except for the damn poor consumer, right? right. And so the, the question is, uh, and I think that's really the, the key pitch where you have people, I mean, I, how, do, how many people do you know that don't have a standard cable connection, video-wise? Uh, I plead the fifth. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, but certainly not my house. Uh, and, and, and in my experience, uh, you know, anybody that I interact with the under the age of 25 or 30 in New York City, it's, it's an alien animal to have a cable connection. And so I think, how are these people going to get brought into the fold, right. served in a good way, and taught that there is a legitimate way to do these things? So you're at a point where you envision 22 markets. Um, you have set an ambitious goal of getting there within the inside of three months. Um, We're gonna miss that. You're gonna miss that? Probably by market and a half or two. But yeah, we'll, we'll probably get 20, 21 out. Uh, um, but we'll make up hopefully in the later half of the year with a couple, few more. What, how, how much interest do you need to have in a market in order to know that it's working and to know that you have a business model that's going to work in it? So uh, we already have that information, and which is basically what we do is we announce that we intend to, uh, which is partly why we announce. And in fact, you see this rhythm, right, where we pre-announce and then we say you can pre-register. And basically what happens is that gives us a guidance on how much initial capacity investment we need to make. So it may be in a market we may say, okay, you know, Salt Lake City, we should probably put in 20,000 subscribers worth of capacity. Or Boston, we need to put 30,000 worth of subscribers worth of capacity, or 50, whatever the number happens to be. And usually what happens is 70% of those pre-registrants convert day one the way we do. Now the cost structure is such, and it's such a modular technology that we can roll in subscriber capacity 6,000, 7,000 subscribers at a time. So we have a very patient model, and that was a critical goal of me when I was starting this was A, I was gonna do this in the cloud just because the economics are so compelling, and B, it had to be so you don't have to bet the farm on a single market, but you could turn a profit at a very low subscriber count in each market, and if you did it 50 times or 40 times, you'd have a very meaningful business that. So we have an impatient uh, CEO uh, given that in five years you're going to have one in four uh, people in this room subscribing, but a patient market. Um, a patient CEO. I don't know whether it's five or seven. I'm, I'm happy with either. A reasonable chance I get fired before that, given the way I run. <laughs> the things. second time you brought that up, uh, imminent. Nothing imminent. I, yeah. I just want to be clear. Um, and and a very patient investor base, which I think yeah. I can't say enough about, because uh, I think this industry, this type of an approach, um, requires that mindset. Well, Chad, I want to thank you for being with us, and we welcome you back in five years, or hopefully a lot. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. Thank Take you. Take care. Um, so up